Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 4 with Black Ice. And of course, we're playing as Germany. Now, you've just missed a very, very interesting talk on um, Twitter about um, some things. And so that's a reason to try to show up on our Saturday shows if you can, Saturday morning, my time here in California. Um, or you can watch, you can even now, when this is up, there'll still be the VOD, the video on demand. You can go over and watch the stuff and look for some of the stuff in between the episodes. And here's some juicy stuff going on that we don't put up on YouTube. So just sort of an interesting thing. But we're going to continue this for those of you who want to watch. So this is now really the battle of France where last episode was more the Battle of Belgium. Yes, we did take Paris in the Battle of Belgium. Okay, we've just got 13 divisions over here. Very good. Um, you guys march. Oh, no, I don't want all of you marching there. Stop, stop, stop. You march to there. Okay, you come down to here. You come over to here. You march your way in. You march your way to Paris just because we could use some more support. No, you're not. You'll come to Paris. I can use some more support there. Come help hold the line, and then once we're there, you can help push the push them back a little bit more. Effectively, okay, well, it's, and we'll move you over here as a central reserve in Liege, or no, um, Lille. Um, these guys are moving up, these guys are moving up, okay, good. That's looking fairly good, and we're still holding up here, and we're battling our partisans. Like I said, the partisans were nothing at this time. They would not have been there. South of Reims is open. Yeah, um, I'm just wanting to more... Um, hold this line until I get some stuff. I'm not sure where is Reims. Um, you're talking here, maybe? I don't know. I don't know where you're talking. Sorry. Yeah, we're we're filling up here. Sorry. Oh, it was okay. Um, what do you mean by collapse? Oh, financial collapse. Um, California's really got a um. There's financial things in California that are situation. We have a lot of people like um, prison guards and other people that are, once they retire, they're going to be a huge budget of retirees because they've gotten such sweetheart deals that the state can't afford them. We're, we're heading towards financial collapse. And I, my understanding, I almost said I know, but I'm not sure that it's true. But my understanding is, is, they were really hoping Hillary was going to win the last election to hope for a federal bailout of California. Come on, there we go. And that just isn't going to happen under Trump. So there needs to be a collapse here. But so long as they keep going on with a, you know, free everything for everybody and letting all these people in and not helping the government deal with people that aren't here illegally. And look, I've known a lot of good illegal aliens. Now, I've not been responsible for their jobs, meaning I didn't hire them. I didn't, I worked with them because they worked at the place that I worked at. They're good people. I just, and I don't want them gone. I want them here legally. And this is giving everybody a hint of what we were talking about. I want them here legally. Uh, we want a certain level of immigration, legal immigration. 
Maybe not huge numbers, but we want some here. But we want to control who comes in, how many, when, who they are, all that kind of stuff. What are their criminal records? I just want it all done legally. Now, some people... Oh, we've lost Paris. Damn. Okay. Well, that isn't good. Okay, you're coming back in. Okay, Liebstender, you're just still a regiment, I know, but come this way. You, sh you should be a super fast thing. This is so wrong. This should be a fast motorized unit. I'm sorry, it really should be a fast motorized unit. So I keep thinking of it as such. Okay. All of three of you, push back in there. Push now. Don't give them a chance to... counterattack like deer. Okay. Um... Push your counterattack while these guys are defending. You come in to help defend. Very unit upgrade, very good. You get back in that fight. Okay, the air unit. That thing just happened, Garrison Flak. Oh, well, we have a 30% bonus. We're heading towards the Africa Corps, so we're gonna grab that. Indirect coal liquefaction, don't know exactly what that means. There were two, two methods that Germany used for liquefaction of coal, and they used them on two different types of coal. I'm not going to go beyond that because I'll start to show how much little I actually know about the, the actual thing. We'll get more aluminum. Steel mill, will resor steel mill resource will output plus one aluminum, so that will be good and useful. You're here now, so the Army Division push down there with one Infantry Division. We don't want to get cut off, but we want to push in, which will force them to react a bit more to what's going on. Come on, I know I'm hitting my head against this door here, but get there, get in there, get into the fight. support that attack you now join and join that attack now good now we're turning that around and you also light panthers go in there not the best for attacking into the city but they've got to overwhelm what's there okay good we're across the river here now so Let's support our move that way, and let's push this way as well. So maybe, uh oh, come on there, that division may not be able. Let's add um, a couple more armored motorized divisions where, okay, one's here. Let's add him to Rommel here. Um,
there were two more, so oh, here they are. I don't know why you stopped way back here, probably because I didn't direct you anywhere further forward. Don't know, that could be the case. support that attack. Okay, new model Panzer IVs. some of these situations over here okay you support that attack but don't leave there you keep ours how's our battle going fair you're counterattacking there not terribly well okay well let's move a proper division in I should probably shut that down and we'll also move a proper division over here not good for partisan suppression, but good for attacking. You support the attack. Don't know if you have good urban bonuses or not. Get in there. And yes, we probably should be shifting some of our air power down. Or no, probably, I know we should. Oh, you keep moving forward. Come on. I already sent you forward. Um, where we go? Okay, here. Oh, looks like they killed off our. Oh, is that the Luxembourg? No, that's that's ours. Looks like they killed off our air power there. I thought I had some there. Okay, well. Yeah. Um. Well, actually, let's move you up here here and these guys can also move forward and operate here 203 okay so um, let's move you to here and here to deal with that air and no, you're only 30 aircraft, but still, you come to here and deal with, or at least help with the air there. We get back into that fight. Okay, that other push didn't go so well, but let's see if we can help with that. Okay, right, the rad, cool. Okay, and that was done to get this. I know it's just one factory plus one factory, but we'll get base efficiency increase and things, so. Oh, 40 days, yeah, we'll pay that price, I guess. We formed the National Labor Service, mostly existing young men. Okay, well, that was, of course, going well before this time. You jump into that fight as well, and you support that fight. I don't want to lose. That province from a counterattack.
really claim this claim on Greek territory. Just what you needed to do. While we're still battling in effing France, you declare war on. <sighs> See, this is the thing. You either have to put on... Either conditions for the national focus to happen. And I'm not talking for the humans, because you can do different things for AI. Either conditions for the, the national focus to happen, like France must be defeated before. Because if they've done this just because, be it with if this, is, if this is not a national focus thing, then this is just a fucking stupid AI. Not that the Italians were all that much better, but still. They were at least smart enough not to do it while they were still fighting in France. They did it when they did it. It was sort of spur of the moment by by Mussolini. The divisions that they sent in, oh, a third of the men or more were off doing harvesting, not at the front ready to fight. So the divisions went in weak. So even that was just ill-planned. But part of the thing was, is of course, they were battling in North Africa, not doing so well. But just throwing in two or three more divisions into North Africa, well, um, how are you going to feed those troops, literally? How are you going to get ammunition to those troops? It was sort of a logistics problem, more than do we have enough divisions to quash the British and Egypt? Absolutely. Italy could have just smashed them with their divisions. They couldn't because they didn't have enough trucks, enough ships, enough airplanes, enough whatever to get enough of the Divisions to the front, well-supplied, well-equipped to be able to smash them. And what the hell are the Japanese doing over here? Oh, God. Get on another rant on that. But Because uh, I think these are sending volunteer things. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, we have Malta. And, yeah, there is this little island out here. And we have a freaking port here. Level 3 port to boot. We have a level 3 port here in Pantelliera. There is a little island there, and there is a little thing there, and I'm presuming it's because it's an island, there's a port there. But we don't have the freaking Curland port that's up here that you should be able to supply. We don't have many other ports that we freaking need in the game, but you're doing this thing with a level three? Oh, God, God, oh, man. I don't see how this helps because you already have effectively enough ports and, you know, controlling of this sea zone from Sicily or whatever. I don't see how... Anything here can affect, and only affects negatively because now you have three divisions, including a Japanese division, defending it. So that sh probably island shouldn't exist. I know it does, but I mean it shouldn't exist on this map. Malta should definitely, but let's, it, it's sort of like having Gozo, which is this little island over here. Be it's a different thing than Malta when you could easily sort of swim between them. Well, swimming might not be that easy, but it ain't much of a different distance. And Gozo is a much smaller little island than Malta, but still it's, it's a two island little archipelago there. Uh, okay, back to the Italian thing. So you can't just throw in more troops to North Africa to defeat them because, one, Italy is not really capable of doing naval invasions effectively, and two, you know, on any scale. Yeah, going after a little Greek island or something maybe, but not doing that big time. And two, you know, you just don't have the infrastructure. Partially it's the transportation. They have enough ships, but it's escorting them and getting the stuff. But it's getting them the supplies from whether it's Benghazi Tobruk or um, Tripoli. There were a couple of, they were building little sort of ideal little towns uh, along here to, to attract the Italian um, colonists. Maybe one or two of them might have been able to take a ship to unload things because they were coastal. Might, maybe, I have no good proof. So maybe, um, What's the best joke? I would love to love to see if a province system a Hearts of Iron Three was in this game personally. 
Um, yeah, no, I, I yeah. 90% of what to do in the states, I just want to, you know, states here, I want to just move that to a province. And just make some of these, like this province here that has swamp in it, just give that zero slots, you know, and give enough slots to Venice and Erdine and Trieste and whatever to sort of make up for. So some, some provinces would have zero slots. Fine. You know, zero, because obviously like you have zero slots in some of these Pacific islands. You can't build, you know, anything in them and well there's maybe two unlocked here or small island level one i don't know you know so but you know just make some of this stuff either zero or no without without building infrastructure to sort of do it it means a little more work for the designers because you got to figure out where here you want to put the the provincial slots for for factories i get that but uh so yeah but so italy you know, so you can't really do more here, but Italy's sort of losing. But they think they have an army, and they think they can crush Greece, so they attack Greece. Okay, that's what happened. But they weren't at war with Fr France. had been defeated. France was at peace. They were at war with the British. They weren't yet at war with the Soviet Union. Yeah, that. And so you can code this to say either have conditions like Paris must fall, France, Vichy must be formed, or I don't know. Conditions like that to be able to start the national focus and or conditions that once the national focus has been done, to then unlock a, an event like this one here, but, oh, own city of Danzig. Well, I don't know why I don't own the city of Danzig here. Um, I think I own the city of Danzig. Oh, well, maybe it's uh, not occupies, but owns. It's not. We haven't yet integrated into Germany. Okay. I think that may need to be tweaked because that core should probably already be out there. But, um, or that division. But, you know, have it one of these things that, oh, um, you know, have have the national focus create an event like this and then say, oh, well, Paris must be held, um, you know, you know, have a few other things. That must, you know, France must be knocked out of the war or something. Then this goes pops up oh good well we can do this i'm not going to do this right now because we're in the middle of a fight with the division so once we get um forming um delete the motor uh, okay now i'm not going to upgrade in these i'm going to wait till the battle of france is over for any of these things to happen but um yeah so you, know, you can have it like that and then you know, it's grayed out until the AI can do it, and then the AI can do it and have it happen. You can do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, oh, Discord. Okay, yeah. Hopefully that one works. Or no, yeah. If it doesn't work, I'll I'll do it one too. But hopefully that will work. Okay, you two infantry divisions support this attack there. You join the attack on the Paris. You join the attack into Paris. Seventh Panzer Division. That's Rommel's division. And it's the one with the Czech Panzer twos and these Czech built tanks and infantry tanks too. I guess that's the Panzer fours there or something. Okay. Well, now that they are here. They're pushing out, but for some reason you're not following, so you follow into there. You push down into there and you support the attack. Mostly just to keep pushing on everybody here. Okay, we're going to grab one of your divisions and go down to here. Well, these other two are going to cross the river and be ready to attack from there. And wow, the Italians have an optimistic battle plan. Well, maybe theirs will collapse enough. Mm, um, at some point, I plan to. Taking it out, uh, Yugoslavia. 
Not that it's any particular signals intelligence, okay. And desert warfare equipment. Not that it's any particular rush to do so. Let's give you to Rommel. Move you two into the position there. Um, any particular rush to... I want to do it sometime after the fall of France, for sure. Okay, you always... If you're going to do these... Now, sometimes you might go, Hey, we don't have the, you know, extra slots to, to you know, go down your research line. But always do the ones that will speed up other research first. If you're going to do them, do them first. Because ultimately, in the long run, it'll be better. Yeah, I know, some, some juicy thing like a new model of plane and while we're mentioning that or something may be ripe and you really want it to go to really get into the um uh, 50 days really wanted to get it into the you know fight or something i get that but really do that first we have the basic transport we do have heavier transports i think down here so yeah these but we're obviously not there yet um let's okay research of vulnerability from bombing yes but more research efficient or re, uh, production efficiency Well, this is a tough fight, but it isn't unreasonably so. So at least to some degree here, they're getting their balance. Well, where did I just say? Could, uh, doing some BS over here. Okay, I don't know. You go back to Krakow. Oh, let's look at our repairing bomb damage or combat damage first let's get the ones that are well we sort of have okay um we'll get to infrastructure but not just yet okay seven divisions who do we want to give them to um He looks like he has the slots for them, so let's... Oh, that's too, too, too many. Oh, well, okay, well. These we will unassign. Two of them, okay, and we'll give them to him. And he can have whoever these generals are. I don't really care at the moment. Yes, I do sort of wish I played a little more detailed, but I try to keep these things moving for you guys. Eight divisions smash across that river. You join in the attack, so it's coming from two provinces. And you can come here. Oh, Kluge. Okay. Okay, I'll do that soon, the, uh, the uh, motor cannon. Er, from being out of fuel. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Okay, good, yes. Um, that means I need to trade for more fuel. 
fuel. Okay, Romania for some reason is not delivering any fuel to me. Huh? What? Why? That's part of why I'm out of fuel. Okay, um, well, let's go to zero. Send. Let's see if we can get some from the Soviet. Of course, we're getting oil and not fuel, so I have to keep that in mind with, no, over here with um, refineries, don't, yeah, fuel silos are, I don't know, um, nah, fuel gain, fuel capacity, current fuel base gain from this oil, okay, from f refineries, so... Um, synthetic oil refinery. Rubber. Um. Okay, French French tanks. Yeah, they were a lot of. It's it's hard to say. Um, because there's not just one answer. There's French tanks that are controlled by the infantry, and there's French tanks controlled by the cavalry. And they're different models, generally speaking, almost always, not absolutely sure, but mostly I think so. And so ca the cavalry was its sort of own branch of, a, of the army, and which, you know, had cavalry divisions. So they weren't really armored divisions. The first, oh, what the hell? I'm just noticing these guys are popping up here. Okay, well, come down here. Yeah, I know you have partisan effects, but really, people, you're overdoing it, Black Ice. I get I get the idea that you want to keep us occupying. I do, I do, but that's overdoing it a bit much. Um, so the one, uh, so the ones, uh, it was the Gaul is the first guy who gets the first armor division. Now, I've misinterpreted something. Um, the Gaul tries to get the idea of an armor division across to the army. It doesn't work out. And so he decides to publish a, a book. Uh, and it's called in English, is Towards a Professional Army. And that's part of what he's looking at, but really it's a book about modern mo motorized warfare, which would include panzer divi or armored divisions. But it's a sort of motorized division as much. I haven't read it, not even an English translation. I just sort of read about it, so I can't really comment in detail on it. But that's my understanding. This book does terrible damage. I didn't think it did originally because the problem with it, there was a word in its title, professional. The thing that the French government feared the most, more than it feared the Germans, I'm not talking in 1939, because I think he writes it in 36. I'm not talking in 39, obviously the war starts at 39, but I'm not even talking like 39 just before the war starts. I'm talking about in like 36. The French government fears, the, mo the thing that it fears the most, again, you remember a couple episodes ago, those of you watching on YouTube, you know, the meme about um, the French surrender meme versus how quickly Belgium or Denmark falls in seven hours. Well, everybody was under the perception that France has the greatest army in the world. So the thing the French government fears the most isn't anybody else's army anywhere in the world. It fears its own army more than anything else. It's its greatest fear. It's not the revolutionaries that are in the streets at times in France. It's the French army. It fears the French army. 
there are various reasons for this. Um, you know, whether it goes back to they think it's going to be a, a a Bonapartist or a monarchist or a fascist coup or whatever it might be, or it might just hey they realize we're a bunch of idiots that are screwing up the country and the, you know, and the army's going to throw us all out and you know, set up new elections or something without necessarily being you know monarchist or something. I don't know exactly what they thought the army was going to do, but it was their greatest fear. What they liked about the French army was, and wanted to maintain it as, was as a mass conscript army. Because they did not fear the average French soldier, the average French population male being a soldier. You know, either full, full time for, you know, uh, six months, a year, two years, whatever the, the normal draft period was. And then continuing after that as a reservist for however many years. They did not fear that. So they did not fear a large army. They did not fear a mass army, you know, the army of the people. What they feared was sort of the professional military elites and some professional military divisions that were primarily made up of, you know, long-term um, career soldiers, you know, career privates, guys that were going to not just be, you know, in there for whatever their normal term of enlistment, but make a career out of being a soldier. They feared that. Now, I met one French, I met several French foreign legionnaires, but I met one French foreign legion, legion and he wasn't, I can't go into too much detail of why and what we were talking about, but he wasn't bullshitting me, I'll tell you that. He was an, he was an American who had served for a while in the French foreign legion. And we were hanging out, chatting, there were you know, some other people, but after a while, just him and me for a little while. He liked to be told what to do. He wanted to just, and he had retired. I mean, he was old enough. He wasn't ancient or anything, but he was no longer young enough to be a French foreign legionnaire, private or, soul, or corporal or whatever, or sergeant or whatever he ended up being, I forget. But definitely not an officer. You know, he just, he, he would be absolutely fine. He was an American, but he would absolutely be fine with a well-run dictatorship. You know, he was... He, he it was just his mentality and so if he was in when he was in the french foreign legion and he was there for years and i trust me if we ever to go into it someday i could could, could i have to look it up but i can name the person and show you photographs of him if his french foreign legion officer said oh well we're going to do a parachute landing and we're landing here and here's your target it's the french you know um capital you're to round up the you know the french government Sure, fine. He he would have done it, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, he didn't care. He was he was a professional soldier. He did not care. Um, and he did see actual military combat. Now, I'll date it like back in the 70, 1970s, you know, so I, I doubt the guy. He was older than I was, but um, and he may still be alive today. He's younger than my father, I would say. But yeah, but I don't know um because my father's still alive so so yeah he you know um he very well could be alive today but i don't know but so you know he's seen combat but he would have been happy jumping into paris jumping into berlin jumping into you know timbuktu on a military operation it didn't matter to him so okay that's a real foreign um foreign legionnaire who wasn't boasting because i could just tell the con type of conversation we were having and he was, it wasn't, you know, it was before the days of anybody having, you know, per, I mean, they did have personal recorders, but he knew I, and it wasn't, I wasn't interviewing him. We were just hanging out and talking about things. So, you know, he didn't care about Republican and Democratic politics. He just thought all that was a bunch of nonsense. And so he wasn't, he wasn't blowing up, blowing smoke up my butt or any trying to make sound big or anything. He just didn't care. And I could tell it. He just didn't care. And so this is what France feared is just what this, uh, he was an American, but again, a, a professional soldier in the French army. That's what they feared. They feared the idea of a French soldier who was going to do, you know, being a professional soldier, their job as a soldier, they're going to have their career as a soldier so that they didn't care. They were going to do what their officer said. They feared that more than anything else. So de Gaulle's book on modernizing the French army and trying to make it a more of a professional instead of a mass conscript force was part of it. Because there's also a lot of problems with, you know, you can talk, look at the Chieftain's video of why they do their two-man or three-man tanks. Well, part of it was is men cost money, and the French state doesn't have that much money. 
Well, the Gauls, part of the idea is, well, let's cut the army in half in size and make it a well-trained force, well-equipped force for the same amount of money. Well, that's not what the political leaders want. So that actually puts the Gaul in, in the doghouse, as it were, both with the politicians and the military people who are trying to, you know, the generals and such, because um, he was just a colonel at the time, I think. Wasn't a general, I know that, but I don't... Maybe a major, but I think a colonel at the time that he wrote the book. You know, really sort of dents his, his career path because it's now causing problems for the military leadership that here's a, an officer, you know, trying to push a professional army with that's what not what the um, political leadership wants. So, yeah. Um, and so he wants that. So this is, he gets the first armored division that's set up in after the war starts before the invasion of france so the cavalry units aren't put together as like a proper division that's motorized that has armor so they're not a, an armored division but they are armored units intended to operate like traditional cavalry and either maybe creating a breakthrough but also sort of trying to exploit a breakthrough afterwards but most of the french tanks go to the infantry and they are slow and they're defined very much as the idea of supporting infantry attacks. And what are we talking about? Standard weapon use M4, M16, yeah. Yeah. Well, the M4 and the M, well, the M4 is sort of a modern version of the M16. Um, there's various changes. I've own things that you would could call an m16 i say that because they weren't fully automatic or anything like that but um the one that i had was more set up as a car 15 but it had like the the old forward assist that you know because they wanted to be able to because the way that the m16 was is you could only withdraw the bolt and then release the bolt you couldn't push the bolt close closed so if it didn't go closed all the way because whether dirt or other things was sort of kind of or bad thing you couldn't force close that up what they called the forward assist on the side of it that you could hit and sort of shove the bolt forward so i had something that was very close to an m16 but short and light lighter version sort of sort of somewhat off the vietnam era type thing the modern m4 no longer is fully automatic it is three shot burst there are some other improvements over it the person on the street like brett is sort of saying putting together is sort of like an m16 to what they would see but it's me as a gun collector and sort of aficionado um know them as sort of two different things all based on eugene stoner's design basics but um and they take the same magazines take the same ammo you know similar sorts of things like that yes different jam doesn't jam as much overheat yeah the m4 is definitely an improvement over it um i don't know a lot about the m4s because quite honestly i have not been keeping up with the civilian versions of the modern stuff very much um the car 15 that i had again a car a proper car carbine 15 ar-15 um the ones that actually used in vietnam were full were select fire they had semi and full automatic mine was just um Select fire. I bought it from a buddy, buddy knowing the condition of it. He had built the gun legally and all the stuff. You just you get the receiver and you build the stuff and you know he went through this stuff. I bought it from him. This is a long time ago. And it's by what that then is called, sort of called a Franken gun, meaning the receiver was by one company, you know, the upper and lower receiver, different parts from different companies. They never quite worked well. So I've always had a um an aversion to the m16 system personally because of my early experience with it and i do know i've not shot a modern m4 or e even a proper civilian version based on the modern m4 system um i do know it is much more reliable than the old stuff that i'm sort of used to in the olden days so that's why i went over to um fnfals and hk91s and uh similar sorts of weapons like that that are absolutely dead reliable and excellent excellent guns yeah shorter barrel adjustable buttstock that kind of stuff now that was the shorter barrel and adjustable 
buttstock. Well, the Car 15 that I had actually had a barrel shroud to make the barrel look shorter with a you know a big flash hider on it, but you know, obviously it has to be the legal limit of it, but was sort of shorter and did have that adjustable stock very similar to the M4. Um, which is better? For who? For what? AK-47 M16? Well, let's say, let's presumably you have a good operating one. And if you maintain the original M16s properly, and a lot of soldiers were given misinformation in Vietnam, so it got a really bad rep there. And mine was just a curiosity that was so bad, even when it was clean. Um, the M16 is a more accurate rifle. Its ammunition is lighter weight, so you can carry more of it for the same amount of weight. There's a lot of reasons the M16 is better. But if you're an uneducated peasant from somewhere in the world, including the Soviet Union, and you're handing somebody, here's gun, shoot gun, get sprays bullets out the barrel somehow, you know, in that general direction, the AK is going to be better for that person. Well, I hear the modern SA-80s, and I don't know the L1, A1s or whatever, you know, various versions of it, um, I hear are better than the original ones. So I don't know when you were in the original ones, Junk and Bear Bearing, I hear were terrible. I do have some basically SLRs. I have some L1A ones. They don't have the original receiver. And you know what the receiver is on the gun. Um, oh, oh, regard, okay, the HK416. Um, and I, I know what it looks like, but I really don't know much about that particular HK either. But I have a bunch of L1A ones. The the main sort of receiver I have is not the L1A one, so it can't even and it's removed a couple little parts. But otherwise, I have a bunch of them. I mean, like five or six of them, um, SLRs. They're, and they're lovely guns. I own those as well as proper FNFALs too. Um, I have I have a collection of fouls of various types. Um, but yeah, so no, I I I I can put my head, quickly put my hands on a couple of. of SLRs, they're great guns. Great guns. I mean, shortly I just walk into another room and put my hand on one. Um, so every everything you would be used to on it, you would just uh, receive receiver that looks slightly different. One thing I still need to get built is an L1A1. Uh, or, yeah, an L1A1A, um, uh, the Australian. I have an, a proper Australian receiver. I need to get some more parts for it to complete that gun out. Oh, the AK-47 is easier to use, most assuredly, for, for an educated person. And part of use is cleaning and maintaining the weapon. Yeah, the, okay, it's the A3. Sorry, I don't keep, you know, I know what the SA-80 is. I've never shot one. Like, where I've shot a FAMAS, the, the French Bugle, as it's sort of whatever French Bugle is in France. You know, the bugle. Uh, I've shot a FAMAS. I've shot a Steyrog, you know, which is the Austrian, but I've not shot an SA-80 or even a civilian version of it. But yeah, I hear that the, the modern ones are, are good, and I don't keep up to date on all of the various. In... Yeah, it's it's hard to destroy that. Yeah. Well, you can function the AK without any real maintenance on it. Um, for a considerable time, if ever. I mean, you know, as long as you're not, like, actively trying to sabotage the weapon. Because people will do for demonstrations, you know, pour dirt into the receiver and then sort of just kind of shake it up. If you're not actively trying to sabotage the weapon, it's almost impossible to keep one of those from running as long as it starts out. Oh, sorry, your computer crashed. Good to hear you're back. So, yeah, um, yeah, so no, I'm, I'm a fan of, I know the British call it more the SLR, the self-loading rifle, as opposed to the L1A1 or the FAL, but yeah, I, and I, so I have both the inch and metric pattern guns. The little flip down cocking handle on the L1A1, I, it's a nice idea, but it don't work so well in that it's better to have the cocking handle always out there. They sort of, the British wanted that so it didn't catch on gear, but eh, the the original Belgian is better. It you know, and so since I've used both, I know both fairly well. Oh, you come here. Okay. 
So I, like I say, I've used both of those weapons. Yeah, every all the stuff I'm using is in, is semi-auto versions of the things. So it's not absolutely exactly the same as, you know, whether it's the M16 type guns or the... Some nation... Well, the British only let the... Um, the L1A1 in a semi-auto mode where the Argentines had um, uh, FALs which were, you know, select semi and full auto fire. Is the enemy air bombing bad? Well, we can take a look. Um, I don't know if it's affecting me much. We can see some here. They have enemy air superiority. Um... Sure, it's an effect. I don't know how big of an effect it is. You need to go there and just end that. I definitely know a lot of soldier types that have a lot more experience with full automatic weapons than I do. But I have, at least in some cases, because obviously there's various special forces types that get their hands on all kinds of unique and interesting firearms from around the world. Most assuredly they do. But um, compared to, at least, in, at least in my talking to a lot of soldiers and marines, uh, I have a pretty broader base than a lot of them do in, in firing the different weapons. And that matters for evaluation, because if you've only ever shot an AK-47, you can think it's the greatest weapon in the world because you haven't fired anything else. Or, you know, maybe you've shot something else, or like if you're an American Marine, now, I don't know how common it is to get your hands on and actually not only just pull the trigger once. See, this is the thing. If you just, if you get like an AK-47, you take it to the range, you pull the trigger a few times, and eh, what do you know about it? And, that, and some of the guns, literally, that's all I've done. But other guns I've really owned and know. And you learn the care and feeding and, and how well it works. And you're not just using it under ideal conditions. You're not carrying it for a while. And so a lot of soldiers know what they know well about the gun that they know. But it's comparing it to other things can sort of um, really determine stuff. Um, I watch a channel called CN Arsenal. They're, they, they're the ones that do the World War I guns. And May, the woman there who shoots the gun, she now knows so much about how those guns work and in comparison. Um, not that she's like an expert on, you know, field stripping the guns. No, she's just pointing the gun, shooting the gun. She she shoots well enough. But she's now shot, you know, 100 plus World War I guns from various pistols, light machine guns. You know, most of the major, if not all of the major light machine gun models of World War I, she shot. So she can now compare all of those guns and maybe she's not necessarily an expert on any one gun, but she knows how they work, how they work in comparison to each other. And that matters. Okay, you're taking too long to get across the river. You come back down over to here. And that does sort of matter. It's one, that's one thing that, you know, knowing one thing really well means you know that, but doesn't mean you know everything else. American training, but we had to use a host of weapons before going to Afghanistan, so we knew how the enemy weapons operated. Very good. Now, Drunken Barbarian, you were saying you're in the commandos, um, but it was that your common average soldier gets that, or is that that you're in the commandos so you know that kind of stuff? I'm just trying to, to learn from... Absolutely, Brett. Um,
What do they want? Okay, any of it would provide us with light tanks. Okay, we'll accept that. I don't know why it's taking freaking convoys we're right across the border here, but um yeah, um because I'm used to shooting 308 rifles, I know that most of the time fully automatic is is useless. But it does have a psychological effect, and I think And I've also talked to a lot of people that have fought in the third world. And not just like in Vietnam, but in other places. And I think a lot of people um, particularly Americans and often the American military. The American military has long had this. It goes back, you know, I think really sort of starting in the American Civil War. But they, they sort of look back at the American revolutionary soldier with his um, Kentucky long rifle. Really, it was a Pennsylvania long rifle, but Kentucky long rifle. And that they were sniping the British out because they had these really great rifles. That's not how it happened historically, one. But two, if you look at actual combat situations... Most of the riflemen, more than half of the riflemen that landed on the beaches on D-Day, never fired their rifle. Now, the guys who had the BARs, almost every single one of them fired their BAR. But almost n like half or, or more than half or something never fired their rifle. They never got to a place on Norm, you know, on Normandy Beach Day, you know, on D-Day. But they were at a place that they were thought they should pull the trigger on their M1 Garand. It just there was no target. There was they were huddled behind a hill, or they were running from place to place. Now some guys shot, but a lot of people didn't shoot their gun. And America, American military, the Marine Corps is one of them. And they do hold this. They hold this myth of the rifleman. And the Marine Corps, you know, got investigated at one point in Iraq, um, because. So many of their kills were headshots. Because I guess their reports or something, you know, um, on the dead bodies that they were getting, they reported where the, you know, where they were hit. So many of, you know, high percentage of, of headshots. And some of the people, higher ups or whoever was looking at this, were thinking, were they executing prisoners? So they did an investigation. No, they just found out that most of the guys they were shooting at were looking out of a window, shooting at them out of the window, so the, the target that presented itself to the Marine Corps soldier, Marine, whatever you want to call him, but the guy in the field, the guy with the rifle in the field, I know Brett gets prickly at the term soldier, but I'm meaning that sort of grunt in the field, I guess I could use that term for the Marine Corps. Um, the target he was presented with was somebody's head because the rest was below a, a fairly thick wall, and he's using a 223 bullet, which is a lightweight bullet, are, are hitting him in the head because they are good marksmen. They are better than your average soldier marksman. The Marine Corps, I mean, uh, compared to other armies, because of the amount of training they had. But, and that sort of also, to some degree, in a specialty counterinsurgency situation in urban combat doing suppressive activities in Baghdad. Not fighting in the desert in, like, the first desert storm when they stormed across the desert and most of the people just freaking surrendered, but not in that sort of combat. This was sort of in a specialty thing with limited number of targets sniping at Marines that they were shooting back. All these kinds of conditions applied. But a lot of the battles are won at the psychological level. The soldiers just give up and retreat, go away, surrender, whatever. And firepower, the simply the noise. The and I don't know. I've not. I'm going to watch what I say here. I have been downrange of bullets that have passed very close to me. I'm not saying I was being shot at. I'm not saying I wasn't. 
I'm, but I was uh, what I'm thinking of not so much being shot at but I was behind something and the people knew I was there they were shooting at some targets but I've been very down range of bullets going within a few feet of where my head is the point and they no chance of hitting me I'm not saying I was in danger that's why I want to be clear about this wasn't in a, in a dangerous situation in the sense no bullets could hit me but bullets were passing within two or three feet of my head so I was hearing the bullet travel by me and smack into something, you know, a target, you know, because you can know some of these ranges where you can sort of be below a, a concrete barrier thing with a big berm and bullets are going into the target above you. So they're whizzing by that kind of thing. So I can hear the bullets traveling within feet of my head. OK, well, just think of my psychological reaction if I was laying out on a flat field. And those bullets were within two feet of me, but I know there's, I have no cover. I'm just simply a small target laying out in the field, maybe in the grass, maybe sort of hard to see. Bullets are within a foot or two of my head, okay, changing the, the situation. Like I'm, I'm trying to say I wasn't in a dangerous situation I'm talking about. You know, I mean, dangerous in the sense if I did something stupid like look up over the hip thing, I might get shot in the head, but I wasn't, that wasn't the point. I was, you know, just in the sort of the safe zone behind where you're supposed to be. So I know what it's like to have bullets come near me, okay? That's, that's my point. And so if you're hearing the boom, and then you're hearing a bullet pass within a foot or so of your head, so that could be full auto. Now, it could be coming from like a, um, a light machine gun, not a um, rifle. But it could be coming from a, li a rifle. It could be coming from a submachine gun. You're hearing that full auto. You're hearing the bullets whiz by your head or, near, you know, even five yards away from you. You're hearing all this stuff. There's a lot of psychological effect in warfare. Again, if you're looking at special counter-terrorist type things, that's a bit different. But in general sort of warfare, like we're looking here, firepower, simply firepower, is an effective thing. So it becomes less useful for something like an FNFAL at 308 caliber but I would say now the three-shot burst isn't a bad choice. And, okay, um, the, American, the average American soldier that got sent to Vietnam was poorly trained. Um, let's see, my grandmother's cousin, whatever he is to me, but I knew him fairly well. He was a paratrooper in World War II parachuted in, I forget what division, but parachuted in one of the divisions into the Philippines, you know, airborne assault onto the Japanese in the Philippines, fought in the Philippines. Later, fought in Vietnam. He was a battalion commander by the time he gets to Vietnam. Fought in Vietnam. And I asked him, because, you know, the spray and pray, literally holding a gun up over your head, pointing it over the wall, can't even see the target, just letting a mag, you know, burning through a magazine, just pulling the trigger, dumping a mag dump downrange, and all this stuff. And I asked him, the soldiers that you were with, the paratroopers that you were with, if you had given them, in, in World War II, with their training, if you had given them a true select fire weapon, you know, had semi and full automatic weapon, would they have used it appropriately meaning like when you're going for the the assault of the trench or you're jump you know, you're you're jumping in the building that the the Japanese may be in because he was liberating some of the prisoner of war camps or something jumping into the building and ready to spray up close in the building so they would take that M16 and maybe go full auto on it that but when you're out in the open would they be you know longer range would they be doing single shot absolutely and his his conclusion was that the soldiers that he was with with his airborne division trained for World War II were trained to a higher standard than your average soldier, and he was, again, a battalion commander in Vietnam, than they were in Vietnam. So had you given M-16s to the U.S. paratroopers, now that may be different than the National Guard, you know, some other soldiers' training levels in the U.S. Army, but his paratroopers in World War II would have been, again, the M-1 Garand probably shouldn't be full automatic, generally speaking. That's why you have a BAR or something heavier. But if you were talking a 223, and he was very familiar, of course, with the M16 from his Vietnam experience. Though by the time he, he, he told the story to me, because he had been in the Pentagon for multiple tours before being assigned to go to Vietnam. Oh, you, well, you have to go down to, um, you have to qualify with a 1911 before you get sent off. What? What? Yeah, yeah you got to go down to the basement because there's a, a gun, a, 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 range, a gun range down in the basement of the Pentagon. You got to go down there and qualify. Really? Oh, damn. Okay. So he goes down to it there. You know, by that he wasn't as old as obviously when I knew him. 
later in the 70s and 80s. But um, he goes, so he goes down there, gets his, gets the, one of the range 1911s for the qualifying, and the range map, you know, he starts to pick up and point the range, the gun down range. And the range, oh, no, 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 put two hands on it, hold it like this, and, you know, like you're taught in the Army how to do it. No, no, he just picks it up one-handed, boom, 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 sh shoots expert and walks out. Because he was trained in World War II, they were trained to shoot the 1911 with one hand, not a two-handed grip. So he went and shoots pistol-level expert <laughs> without any, hadn't shot a gun in years because of his level of training to go in World War II when he was getting ready because by the time he's going to Vietnam that his weapon was going to be a 1911 once he got in country to be issued that not the M16 but he was familiar with it and knew how it was used and knew what was going on and so he agreed with me that it was a training problem for a 223 weapon that's again different than your SLRs or your M14s or your um, G3 slash HK91s or something 308 that's an entirely different matter but firepower does matter and good proper training does matter. So I think the three-shot burst mechanism on the M4 is to make up for bad training. I do think that the modern qual levels of training versus the levels of training in Vietnam are much superior. At least that's my um, understanding of it. Let me scroll back and see some of this. On enemy weapons. Okay. I want to see all combat troops. Very good. I didn't know that about the British Army. That's very good to hear. Yeah, so I'm just catching up on all of this. Brett is actually in the military right now. I don't know if he gets to that. We're trained. You're trained in Mozambique nowadays. Okay, Brett. Didn't know you were trained in Mozambique. There you go. Through. Yeah, that conspiracy theory is bullshit. Yeah, I'm not like, again, I don't want to specify that I was specifically being shot at. I mean, I don't tell all my life stories, but what I'm talking about, just times that I've been on, on a range situation in which um, bullets were passing very near me. So I know what, uh, again, it wasn't like, oh, I'm worried about being shot at, but just the idea of hearing the sound of the bullet pass very near my head in a distance thing, not so much as in a danger thing. And so weapons are psych... Wet warfare is a psychological action as much as anything else. Part of it is, is watching people get kill killed near you and you deciding whether it's this is a bad spot or this war isn't worth dying for or whatever it is. It's a psychological action. Now that's one of the things I want to examine when I want to do some uh, weapons series, uh, talking about weapons and how they're used and how they, partially you know how they function mechanically, yes, but also how they're used functionally in war, and it's a lot of that psychological elements to it as much as anything else. And so I want to, um, you know, look at that. And so I I keep those into account. I remember having, you know, whether I was back in high school with, because I had, I owned guns by the time I was in high school. Um, I mean, grew up with my father having guns. And when I, out in the country, I, you know, basically had a 22 rifle in my hand every day, uh, all day. But that's another story. But, um, oh, you know, be able to hit your target, blah, 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 blah. I'm going, yeah, hitting your target's nice, but just simply shooting bullets at the enemies, making them duck. You know, even though you're missing, but making them duck, making them get down allows you to advance on them, allows you to push on them. And if they're ducking and you're not, you're winning. And so, oh yeah. 
So, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And so, I've recently, you know, I, you know, I, the full auto versus semi-auto. And then once you jump down to like a submachine gun, which is a pistol caliber thing with a proper stock, a proper, you know, forward grip, those kind of things, full auto is sort of their design um, function, but they're not meant to be a mag dump, not just, you know, they're meant to go three, four shot bursts, um, working like that. Yeah, 25 our overhead, it's frightening enough. Yeah, that's the type of thing. It was a bit more of a um, somewhat improvised type range. Kind of thing I was talking about, where I've been downrange and hearing the bullets go, go by very close. So I've, I've had that experience to me, for me. So I, I know what it's like to hear and like to know the bullets coming by. So that's why I say psychological boom 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 and then but you have a hundred people going boom 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 but a hundred of them doing that that becomes something that a lot of people just can't stand up against and so if you can put that kind of fire and then with the hearing of the the you know the the because you both hear the bullet go by you can because if it's a subsonic and i've been near like a 45 caliber bullet is going slower than the speed of sound you can hear that go by and then you can hear the faster crack as it breaks the sound barrier from like a 223 as it goes by and yeah i've enough of these different types of rounds that i've heard and it's been many years now but heard go by me so you can either hear whether it's the supersonic round or the subsonic round you can hear it go by you knowing that those are all deadly things that are near you going by you and if people are putting a wall of fire at you you're losing and so it's it's a thing so um you know and three shot burst isn't a bad solution it's just not the solution i would pick because of i guess my experience with things um i would go with the more training especially nowadays that we no longer have the draft army that we had in vietnam we have a professional army um i would be going with a uh, select fire light 223 caliber weapon. Same thing. Uh, 223 and 556. Five, Same thing. Um, in Belgium, I presume the law is this way. I know it was back in the 70s and 80s. In Belgium, it is illegal to have a military calibered weapon. But you can have a civilian calibered weapon. The FNFAL was made in 762 NATO. Well, since they outlawed military caliber weapons, the FN started to sell a FNFAL in 308 caliber Winchester, which is a sporting round, which is of course the same round as a um, 762 NATO. So the 223 is the sporting caliber. 223 caliber. 5.56 millimeter is the military caliber. So if in America we're going to d make weapons of war illegal, those that shoot military bullets, they're just going to have to mark them 223 instead of marking them 556. But otherwise they're the same thing. But both the 308 and the 223 were originally developed as a hunting caliber. That again puts the lie to all these assault weapon fantasy bullshit about the 223. It was developed as a 223. It's a, it's actually the same caliber, Brett. It's not a bit smaller. It's the same damn thing. There is a difference in some of the loadings for some of the NATO calibers, but it's more difference in powder and bullet weight, not in barrel diameter or you know, or in bullet diameter. Um, I forget exactly, but it's it has to do with the the twist of the barrel. You know how how and I forget the I'm not good at maintaining detailed you know facts, but it's the rate of the twist in the barrel between stuff that's properly optimized for 556 five, NATO has a different barrel twist or they went to, at least some of the nations went to a different barrel twist than what we commonly used for the 223 and that sort of upset some of the Americans so they're otherwise the same 
thing. You're right, AKB, and that's the the people that know nothing about the guns are are either intentionally or unintentionally. Sometimes they get explained the difference and they still say the damn lies. But they don't really understand what's going on, don't really know. So you get things like Belgium outlawing military calibered weapons, but it's it's a common sporting round 308, so the the F, the proper FNFAL I have is in 308 match, it says, because that's a sporting round. But it is the same damn gun made on the same damn machinery with the same damn rifle twist in the barrel and everything as the the NATO um, 762 NATO round. See, like my Israeli foul is 762 NATO on, says on it because it's still it has the military designation because it comes from Israel, where my Belgian foul is in 308. But they're the same damn bullets. Well. I think we're going to end this episode here. I want to thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed my interesting talks. Um, of course, like if you made it this far and haven't subscribed yet, you better because you'll enjoy the rest of the channel. And I'd love to hear your comments about any of the topics we have today. Um, like your inputs on them. Thank you so much. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.